believing during storms is it possible to believe when things seem impossible let us pray father may you have mercy upon me and may you have mercy upon those who are about to hear your words may you speak to them in jesus holy name i pray amen believing during storms our key text is found in second timothy Chapter 1, verse 12. If you have your Bibles, quickly go to 2 Timothy. I am on my way there. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 12. Now Paul says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Paul says, I suffer, in verse, in verse 12, I suffer, but nevertheless, I am not ashamed. And if you look at the previous verse, verse 11, he says, I, I am preaching and I am teaching. And then in verse 12, he says, I suffer. So he suffers because he has been preaching the gospel. He suffers because he had been teaching the gospel. But he says, nevertheless, even though I face storms in my life, even though I'm facing difficulties, and Paul often was stoned. Paul was beaten times without number. Paul was persecuted by his own brethren. But he says, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. And he goes on to say, for I know in whom I have believed. In whom, not in what I have believed. In other words, Paul is saying, I am not a Christian because of a doctrine. I am not a Christian because of something. I am a Christian because of someone. I know in whom I have believed, in Jesus Christ. And he says that he is able to keep me until that day. What is that day? That is the second coming. And because Paul knew that it was about him and Jesus, that it was about having a relationship with Jesus Christ, it was not about what happens around him, but what happens between him and God, Paul believed during the storms of life. Paul was faithful to God during difficult times. Before we proceed, I want us to read a quotation. Ellen White says, Preachers, now this is for me, this is not for you, but if you're a preacher, this is for you too. Preachers should have no scruples to preach the truth as it is found in God's word. And this is proof that she is sent by God. This is proof that we can trust her writings because she says that preachers should preach the truth found in God's word. And the Bible says that a prophet that does not lead people to God, that does not lead people to God's word, we should not listen to them. So she says that preachers should preach the word. Let's continue to read. Let the truth cut. I have been shown that why ministers have no more success is they are afraid of hurting feelings, fearful of not being courteous, and they lower the standard of truth and conceal, if possible, the peculiarity of our faith. I saw that God could not make such successful. The truth must be made pointed and the necessity of a decision urged. And as false shepherds, false shepherds are crying peace and are preaching smooth things, the servants of God must cry aloud and spare not and leave the result with God. Next quotation, we'll read before we proceed. She says, God will not acknowledge, this is a strong statement, as he shepherds those who speak smooth things. In this fearful time, just before Christ is to come the second time, God's faithful Faithful preachers will have to bear a still more pointed testimony than was born by John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist preached in the wilderness. And Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, In those days John went out preaching in the wilderness, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at 
hand. And the Bible says that the Pharisees and Sadducees were coming for baptism. And John looking at them said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bring forth fruit appropriate to repentance. In other words, come as you are. Come with your sinful habits. Come with your sinful way of life. But Jesus is calling you to come as you are so that he can change you. And that is why he says, bring forth fruit appropriate to repentance. Jesus does not come you, call you, sorry, to come as you are so that you can remain as you are. He tells you to come as you are so that he may impart his righteousness, so that he may impart his character, so that he may transform you, so that you may be Christ-like. She also says, a responsible, important work is before them. And those who speak smooth things, those who are telling people that they don't need to repent, that it's okay, you can be worldly and you can be Christian at the same time. It's fine. Jesus loves you anyway. It's okay. Let us read. Those who are speaking smooth things, God will not acknowledge as his shepherd. A fearful woe is upon them. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 6, and we'll begin to read from verse 44. We won't finish the, whole, the, whole, the verses remaining in this chapter. Verse 44, the Bible says, Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Jesus had just multiplied the bread and the fish and given it to the people to eat. And the Bible says that, there were many people there who ate, and everyone was full. Jesus had just performed a great miracle. I mean, there were so many people, and there was not enough food. The Bible says Jesus prayed over the bread, prayed over the fish. He broke it, gave it to the disciples. They distributed it, and still there was a lot of food left. This was a great miracle. If you go down... Two verse 44, the Bible says, Immediately he, Jesus Christ, made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he sent the multitude away. I want to share a quotation with you. Ellen White says, commenting on Mark, she says, The disciples had that day witnessed the wonderful works of Christ. It had seemed that heaven had come down to the earth. The memory of that precious, glorious day should have filled them with faith and hope had they, out of the abundance of their hearts, been conversing together in regard to these things, they would not have entered into temptation. Now, this miracle that Jesus had performed. This was an amazing thing. And the disciples, of course, they were amazed. But instead of taking what has happened and keeping it into memory, they did not do that. And, in fact, there was a great temptation coming ahead. If you continue to read the quotation, she says that the words of Christ gather up the fragments that nothing be lost were unheeded. Those were hours of large blessings, blessing to the disciples, but they had forgotten it all. They were in the midst of what? Troubled waters. Now, I would like for you to come down to verse 46. The Bible says, And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now I want you to remember this as we go on, that Jesus was the one who put them on the boat. It was Jesus who is sending them into the lake. Now if you continue to read in verse 47, the Bible says, Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Jesus put the disciples in the boat. He told them to go ahead. He would meet them on the other side. Excuse me. And the Bible says that Jesus went up on the mountain to pray. And during the night, there was a great storm. The disciples were alone in the boat. Jesus was not there anymore. 
Verse 47. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Jesus was alone. Verse 48. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. The disciples were in the midst of, of a storm it was a terrible storm the first time they faced a storm previously they were with jesus on the boat jesus was sleeping in the boat in the middle of the storm he was right there but this time jesus is no longer on the boat they are alone and the bible says that jesus walked to them while they were they, they had given up already look at what ellen white says she says that their thoughts were what were stormy and unreasonable and the lord gave them something else to afflict their souls and occupy their minds god often does this when men create burdens and troubles for themselves. The disciples had no need to make trouble already. Danger was fast approaching. A violent tempest had been stealing upon them. And they were unprepared for it. It was a sudden contrast. For the day had been perfect. And when the gale struck them, they were what? They were afraid. And they forgot their disaffection and their unbelief. They're impatient. Everyone worked to keep the boat from sinking. It was but a short distance by sea from Bethsaida to the point where they expected to meet Jesus. And in ordinary weather, the journey required but a few hours. But now they were driven farther. Now, Jesus was the one who put them on the boat. Jesus was the one who sent them out. And Jesus knew that a storm was going to come. Jesus knew what they were going to face. But Jesus also knew that he had performed a miracle in their sight. Jesus also knew that if they were to enter that boat, and if they were to remember the things that Jesus had done for them, how Jesus had rebuked the wind previously, how Jesus had multiplied the bread and the fish, that this storm would not cause their faith to waver. But the disciples forgot everything that Jesus had done. And when they were facing this storm, instead of seeking God first, they were first trying to save themselves. They were trying to fight against the storm by themselves. They did not seek God. She says, if you continue to read, everyone worked to keep the boat from sinking. So they were trying to save themselves instead of calling out to God. Now, if you take your Bibles, Mark chapter 6, verse 48, I'll repeat this. He says, then he saw them straining at the rowing. Jesus, remember, was up in the mountains. He was praying. This was in the middle of the night. huh? It was dark. And they're in the middle of the ocean. There's a storm. But the Bible says that Jesus could see them. Often, when we face trials, we ask, where is God? Does he not care? He does. And God is always watching. God is waiting on us to call upon his name. God is waiting on us to remember what he has done for us in the past, to remember the things that he had done for us. The disciples failed to do that. Nevertheless, God did not leave them alone. If you continue to read Desires of Ages, Ellen White says, Jesus had not forgotten them. The watcher on the shore saw those fear-stricken men battling with the tempest. Not for a moment did he lose sight of his disciples. 
With the deepest solicitude, his eyes followed the storm-tossed boat with its precious burden. For those men were to be the light of the world. As a mother in tender love watches her child, so the compassionate master watched his disciples. When their hearts were subdued, their unholy ambition quelled, and in humility they prayed for help, it was given them. So they tried saving themselves, but they realized that they could not. The boat was being tossed to and fro, and Jesus was watching. And when they cried for help, Jesus Christ appeared. Now if you look down at verse 49, the Bible says, And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a what? A ghost. And cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now I would like to invite you to Matthew chapter 14. If you look Matthew chapter 14 verse verse 29 after Jesus appeared to them they thought it was a ghost. If they didn't even recognize Jesus Christ. And in verse not verse 29 but let us begin from verse 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now imagine. huh? Imagine. You are in the middle of the ocean. It's dark. You're facing a storm. You tried saving yourself and you realized that you cannot save yourself. And out of nowhere, you see something or someone walking on the waters. Desire of Ages, page 381, paragraph 2, Ellen White says the following. At the moment when they believe themselves lost, a gleam of light reveals a mysterious figure approaching them upon the water. But they know not that it is Jesus, the one who has come for their help, they count as an enemy. Terror overpowers them. The hands that have grasped the oars with muscles like iron let go their hold. The boat rocks at the will of the waves. All eyes are riveted on this vision of a man walking upon the white kept billows of the foaming sea. Imagine, just imagine, you're in the middle of the ocean, you're facing a terrible storm, you're about to lose your life, you're panicking, and out of nowhere you see someone walking. In the middle of the ocean, you see a figure. What do you do? Well, the Bible says that they thought it was a ghost. In fact, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 26, it says, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out of fear. They were literally crying, shouting. These are grown men, by the way. And these are fishermen. Whether you are converted or not, big or small, you are going to face storms in this world. You are are going to face trials in this world. You will often weep. You will, at times you will feel like giving up. But know that Jesus is watching. Know that when you are suffering, Jesus is closer. And if you call upon his name, Jesus will walk towards you. If you continue to read in Matthew chapter 14, let us go now to verse... 29. Now Peter, when he saw Jesus, he said, if this is you, let me come. Let me walk also. So in verse 29, the Bible says, so he, Jesus, said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go 
to Jesus. This is the second person that walked on water. Of course, Jesus is the first one. He came to them walking on water. But Peter also walked on water. But Peter was the first one who walked on water and fell and almost lost his life. I want to share a quotation. Desires of Ages 381 verse 3. Ellen White says, They think it a phantom that omens their destruction. And they cry out of fear. Jesus advances as if he would pass them. But they recognize him and cry out, entreating his help. Their beloved master turns. His voice silences their fear. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Isaiah 43 verse 1 to 3 says, For I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with what? With thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. And this is true. When the Israelites wept and cried, to God because they were in slavery in Egypt. God sent Moses and Moses led them through and there was a problem. They were came across the Red Sea and behind them their enemies were coming to destroy them. So they began to complain and say, God, why have you led us so far to kill us here? Why not let us die in Egypt? There were graves in Egypt. The Bible says that God split the Red Sea, and they went through. There was a time they needed to cross another river, hmm? the Jordan River. The Bible says that God dried it, and they went through. And if you go to the book of Daniel, Daniel and his three friends, they were told to bow down to a statue. And the Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and that thou should not bow down unto graven images. They refused and they said, we will not bow down. And even if God does not deliver us from this fire, God is still faithful. The Bible says that they made it 10 times hotter, the furnace, 10 times hotter. And they took those three men and they threw them in the furnace. And the Bible says the men who threw them, they burned, they perished because of the heat. They were not even inside, just the heat from outside the furnace burned those men. But the Bible says that not even one hair on their head was burned. They were kept alive in the flame. So when you look at this verse in Isaiah 43, verse 1 to 3, God says, For I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. What God is saying is, I will not remove that difficulty. I will let you I will make you go through the difficulty. I will not remove the fire. Instead, I will keep you in the fire and make you hotter than the fire. When Daniel was to be placed in the lion's den, God did not remove the lion. But God kept Daniel inside the lion's den with the lion. In fact, the lion became a vegetarian just for the sake of Daniel. So God is not saying that I'm going to remove the problem. What God is saying is, I will make you a problem to the problem. If fire comes your way, I will make you hotter than the fire. And if there is a barrier before you, I will not remove it. But I will make you stronger and I will lead you through that barrier. And God is faithful. Let us read our last quotation before we close. Desires of Ages, page 382, paragraph 2. Jesus read the character of his disciples. He knew how sorely their faith was to be tried. Meaning Jesus knew 
what was going to come. And don't forget that Jesus was the one who put them on the boat. Jesus was the one who sent them out. Hmm? Continue to read the quotation. In this incident on the sea, he desired to reveal to Peter his own weakness. To show that his safety was in constant dependence upon divine power. How did this happen? Let us go to Matthew 14. Now remember we read in Matthew 14, 29 that Peter said, I want to walk. And Jesus said, come. Look at verse 30. But when he saw, this is Peter, that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. The Bible says when he saw that the wind was boisterous. In verse, uh, verse 29, it says that Peter was walking. And when he was walking, he was looking at Jesus. But the Bible says when he saw that the wind was boisterous, that means he took his eyes of Jesus and he looked around him. And when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he lost his faith. He lost his focus on Christ. And the Bible says he became afraid and he began to sink. And Peter prayed the shortest prayer I have read in the Bible. Lord, save me. Do you think that if Peter prayed a long prayer, I think he would have drowned. Lord, save me. You don't have to do much. All you have to do is to recognize that you cannot survive on your own and call upon the Lord. Lord, save save me and God will be at the rescue continuing to read in verse 31 the Bible says and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him oh you of little faith why did you doubt Jesus knew that if Peter stepped on the water that he would fall and that he could drown. But because Peter needed an experience like that to grow, Jesus allowed him to come. And Jesus was prepared to reach out to him and to pull him out. God will not remove those trials. Stop asking God to remove them. God will allow them to come to strengthen you. And God will be right there beside you to give you strength. Continuing to read the quotation, Ellen White says, let us begin again. Jesus read the character of his disciples. He knew how sorely their faith was to be tried. He knew what was coming. In this incident on the sea, he desired to reveal to Peter his own weakness to show that his safety was in constant dependence upon divine power. Amid the storms of temptation, he could walk safely only as in utter self-distrust he should rely upon the Savior. It was on the point where he thought himself strong that Peter was weak. And not until he discerned his weakness could he realize his need of dependence upon Christ. Had he learned the lesson that Jesus sought to teach him in that experience on the sea, he would not have failed when the great test came upon him. If Peter would have remembered what Jesus had done, if Peter would have remembered how Jesus multiplied the bread, and the day he tried to walk on water out of self, if he would have remembered that on that day he almost lost his life on the sea and that Jesus saved him, Peter would have not committed the mistakes he later on commits as you go on through the Bible. It is possible to believe during storms. As Paul says, For I am not ashamed because I know in whom I have believed. It is only through Jesus Christ that we can remain faithful during storms. It is not possible.
to remain faithful during difficulties, when you do not pray, when you do not read scripture, you can not remain faithful. And as you face difficulties in your life, at home, at church, relationship, as you face trials, as there, as there are more wars and calamities, as there is more death, more pain, and more tears, hold on to Jesus Christ. And when these things come, Jesus will prepare you for them. Jesus will give you strength to go through the waters. He will give you strength to go through the rivers. He will give you strength to go through the fire and not be burned. He will keep you in the fire and you will outburn the fire. I pray that God may bless you. And I pray that you may hold on to Christ and spend time with Jesus Christ. If this is your desire, I want you to bow your heads as we pray. Father, thank you for your word. Give us strength to believe and to apply your word. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.